Praise God. Amen. Hey, look at your neighbor and say, man, it's good for you to be here. Praise God. I tell you what, I could sit and listen to Brandon I just read out of a phone book. You know what I mean? <laughs> Joe Smith. <laughs> Sarah Clark. That's just wonderful, man. God is so good. He's gifted this house with so many gifted people, individuals, and we just thank God for what he's doing this season. We thank God for you for being here. And if you're here, you're, you're here because I don't think by happenstance you just happened to stumble in here or just decided you made up your mind, I'm going to come to church. I think the Lord was guiding you and drawing you. The Bible says he leads men to, he draws men to repentance by his kindness. Amen. And so whether you're here as a believer seeking something from the Lord or walking in step with the Spirit of God, or you're on your journey to find out more spiritual truths and things that, uh, that, that, are, that are about life and about, uh, about your life, uh, this is the place to be. I really believe that. Amen? Praise God. Amen. Let's give, one more time. Let's just give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Praise the Lord. And again, I do, I'm excited about these classes that are coming up. Uh, next, uh, next week, we're going to start that. You'll hear in, in a little bit from uh, Pastor John. We're going to begin our Sunday night service uh, back up next Sunday night at 630. He'll talk a little bit about that. He'll be conducting those uh, services, being overseeing those services and, and uh, doing, uh, uh, you know, over the service orders and all that stuff. So it's going to be really good. God's doing some exciting things in the house. I want to give you a, a great, uh, exciting update, some exciting news that we can rejoice about this morning. As of Tuesday, we are debt-free as a church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is able, amen. Praise God. And you know, there's an old saying, little is much when God is in it. It doesn't matter. Some, some across, along this journey, this past few years, we've tried to pay off our mortgage. And some has donated uh, uh, a certain amount. Others don't, Everybody's donated different amounts towards the cause. But whatever you gave, God took that and, and made an increase. And so we appreciate that. Little is much when God is in it. And when many people are doing the things that God has called us to do, we can accomplish a whole lot. Amen. Praise God. So we're thankful for that. So, as, so let me just tell you this real quick. Uh, the third Sunday of March, I'm not for sure what date that is, the 17th or the 18th, something like that. It's in one of those days. We're going to have a note-burning service. And so we want to invite you to invite people to come with you. Let's fill the house up. We're standing room only. I mean, let's just fill this place up, rejoice in what God has done, and uh, just see what the Lord is going to take us into. We believe that this is a season uh, of, of great things, amen. Greater things are taking place, and we're just ready to step into the greater, amen. Come on, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, amen, amen, amen. Well, I'm gonna get into the Word this morning, and uh, I, wanna, I wanna finish up a series that we started just about three weeks ago. This will be the third week, talking about stewardship. I wanna finish this up this morning, and uh, we're gonna go into this this. Um, March, this Easter season, with just an anticipation that the Lord is going to do great things in this community, that his name is going to be magnified, and this church is going to be used by God to see his kingdom come, his will be done, amen, on earth as it is in heaven. And, uh, and so we're going to sh we'll shift gears in the month of March, and we'll just work towards those things. Uh, also, in the month of March, we'll begin some fasting, some uh, appointed times of fasting, some corporate fasts. In the month of, month of March, we'll lay that out next week, what those will look like, praying and fasting up until we reach Easter and uh, just what God is going to do. It's super exciting, the partnership we have with our school district that we were able to be able to use the facilities at the high school and work that out, and we're excited about that. I do want to say one other thing before I go into this, and it kind of ties into the message today, and that is the training next Saturday. Um, the gentleman is coming. Um, his name is, is Gary, and for whatever reason, my mind has slipped his last name. It's slipped his last name, but he's coming down from the Midland area to, to do some training, uh, service team training. And so basically, we're going to teach each other. We're going to grow together, and we're going to improve our serve, how we can get better at serving the Lord and taking what we've been given to do and the gifts, gifts we've been given, the abilities we've been given, and how we can take those to bring God greater honor and glory. The Bible says, serve the Lord with 
gladness. It ought to be a joyful thing to give unto the Lord the things that he's given us to do. Amen. And so we ought to, every one of us in this place, there ought to be a place for us, a spot for us that we can take what God has given us and serve him with gladness, give it back unto the Lord. And so next Saturday, if you're not serving anywhere or if you are serving somewhere, if you're leading someplace and you're serving others or you're, or you're on a team and you're under somebody's leadership, we want you to come out to this training next Saturday at 9 a.m. There'll be a continental breakfast of around 8, between 8 and 8.30. You can come a little early, get you a bagel and a, and a donut and a banana, whatever floats your boat, and we'll have it. We should have it there. Amen. And, uh, and come on out. We're going to do that, and the training's going to be excellent. This gentleman has uh, trained uh, people to serve for more than, I think, 30-plus years in the church that he serves, and he's led hundreds and hundreds of people in serving the Lord. And I, so I'm just super excited about what the Lord's going to do in that. There's an anointing to serve. Praise God. I really believe that. We've been anointed to serve. And when we serve, we're serving one another and we're serving the Lord. Praise God. So that's next Saturday morning. You don't want to miss it. And it's free. It's going to be completely free. So get ready for that. I want to start by finishing out today. We've been talking about stewardship the last several weeks. And we talked about stewarding our time, our talent last week. And we're going to talk about treasure this week. And I want to go ahead and put this slide up here. Amen. And most people, they think... What you see when the pastor preaches on tithing, amen. <laughs> People have a perception of what, it, what the pastor's really trying to say, amen. He's after your money. He's after your pocketbook. Honey, zip up your pocketbook. Keep it close, amen. And sad to say, that's how the world perceives when the church talks about money, that it's just about the grab, amen. But we're, I believe there's a biblical... We thought, thought that would be lighthearted. I thought that would help kind of set the tone, amen? <laughs> and I just hope you're still laughing at the end of this, all right? <laughs> Praise God. You can take that off now so we, can, so we can focus. Just go back to something. There we go, all right. Praise the Lord. I got one of you too, so we'll probably play that in a couple of weeks. Maybe I'll play that next week when you preach, Amen. <laughs> Oh, praise God. Uh, C.S. Lewis said this. He said, uh, every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that he has not, in a sense, he, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. There's nothing that you have or do that doesn't come from the Lord and doesn't ultimately belong to the Lord. Uh, when, I, when we talk about stewardship, we often think about, you know, money, church budget, giving of money. That's what we often asso associate steward with. And we will talk about money today a little bit, but that's, but the thrust, the, the idea, the, the, the main theme, I think the main idea that we've try, we're trying to capture here as a church and what I've tried to, to lay out the last few weeks is that stewardship encompasses every aspect of our life, not just the money aspect or not just the giftings aspect, uh, not just the time. It's every aspect of our life. All of us are called to be stewards. Stewardship, I said uh, this a couple of weeks ago, is not a choice. We're called, when you get born again, you're called to steward something. God has given you something to oversee, to manage, whether it be your relationship with him, your relationship with others, a ministry that he might call you into, the job that he's blessed you with, uh, and any, whatever it may be, whatever you have, God has given it to you to be a steward of. And so stewardship's not a choice, but the quality of stewardship is. What we do with what God has given us is what we can choose to do with, right? And we'll, we've seen that in the, the, power, the parable of the talents. He said to the one, good and faithful. He said to the other, uh, wicked and lazy, amen. And so there is, a, there is a choice between how well we do. There is a choice that we make on how well we steward the things God has given us. And I can say that honestly, some steward better than others. And I can say honestly that I haven't always stewarded faithfully the things that God has given me. Even this week, just kind of going over this, uh, studying for this week's lesson, I was convicted by 
the idea of stewardship and what it really means to be a steward and, and how, I, how, Lord, there have been moments and times that I've taken for granted what you've called me to. I've taken for granted the relationship I have with you, the access I have to you, and I've also taken for granted the responsibility that you've given me to be a faithful steward. Now, here's, this is the great thing. There is grace, 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 grace. Where sin abounds, grace more abounds, Amen. And there's grace to get it right. There's, if we have today, then we have opportunity to get it right. And so some of the things we talk about today might, some may say, well, I've never done that or I haven't practiced that or I've quit doing that. And we can say that there's grace and forgiveness today to get back on track, whatever that area of your life is, to be a better steward. Amen? Amen. I was reading a, a couple of articles and come across this one article about stewardship, and I want to read some of the principles that the, the gentleman who wrote this article uh, on stewardship, and he talks about four principles of stewardship. Uh, and stewardship, again, it encompasses every aspect of our life. Uh, the first principle is the principle of ownership, and we know that uh, when we study the Word of God, we said it, uh, we'll say it again and again, Psalms 24, 1, the earth is the Lord and the fullness of thereof, and, and all those who dwell therein. Uh, the NLT version says, the earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all the people belong to him. In the very beginning when God created, he made everything. He created uh, in its kind, after its kind, he made everything in its place. And then he waits till the very end, the last day or of his creation, and he makes man and he creates man out of the dust of the ground. He forms man and fashions him in the image of himself. And, he, and then he puts man in a position of dominion over the earth to do what? To work to steward the things that God had given him. So ownership has always belonged to God. I thought about this this week. We know that in the scripture it says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air. And the devil had uh, given, had to try to offer Jesus uh, to bow to him and to worship him. He said, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. And I thought about that. Well, then if God owns it all, then how does the devil have the power to offer Jesus the kingdoms of the world. The devil doesn't have anything that God hadn't allowed for him to have. Amen. And it says he's the prince of the power. Let me tell you something. The prince bows to the king. Amen. And the king is reigned sovereign and, and supreme. And so God is king over the universe. And so whatever things are in place or it, are all to serve the purpose and the glory of God. And so everything belongs to God. Stewardship expresses our obedience regarding the administration of everything God has placed under our control, the fundamental principle of biblical stewardship. God owns everything, and we manage or administer on his behalf according to what he wants and what he desires. Uh, Deuteronomy, i just show this scripture real quick. Deuteronomy uh, chapter, 18, chapter 8, verse 17, the Lord, uh, through Moses, was speaking to the people, getting them ready to go in and access the land of promise, to access all that God had uh, prophesied through Abraham, and, and God had promised them. And so they're getting ready to access it. And so he's signed, giving them some reminders in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. It's the retelling of the, the journey, the 40 years in the wilderness, and recounting that to remind them of where he's brought them from and what, what were their, their, uh, their pitfalls were along the way and what they're going to need to remember going into the, into the land of promise. And one of the things he says he says, you've got to be aware, verse 17, lest you say in your heart, by my power and the might of my hand, I have gotten this wealth. Verse 18, he says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And so we didn't create anything or produce anything that God hasn't given us the ability to do it, amen. If you've accomplished anything of great notability it's, or notoriety, it's because the Lord gave you those faculties to do the thing that you've able to do, amen. If you're educated, if you've reached high levels of education, it's because God gave you the ability to think and to, and to uh, articulate and the ability to learn, amen. If you've been able to build things with your hands, it's because God gave you that ability to do that, amen. So whatever it is, we can't take credit for any of it. And the moment that we do, we find ourselves in danger. Uh, I remember the story of Daniel. Daniel, uh, in the book of Daniel, and when Nebuchadnezzar had these encounters with God, he was the king, the emperor basically of the civilized world. He had dominated the civilized world and ruled. He was the first great empire. And so he comes along the scene, and he's got a lot of issues with pride and, 
and, and he thinks a whole lot of himself and God warns him in a dream that if he doesn't turn to him and acknowledge him, that he'll bring him low. The very thing that he set him up for, he'll take away from. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job got this understanding and he understood that when he had faced life's troubles, that it wasn't about anything that he could do in and of himself, but just to praise God. Amen. If the Lord wants to bless me, he'll bless me. If he wants to take it away from me, he'll take it away from me. I'm just going to trust him in all things. Amen. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't have that relationship. And so a year after this dream that he has that warns him, he goes out on the terrace of his palace and he looks over and says, and looks over his king and says, look at everything that I have done. Amen. I am so great. Look at me. Look what I have accomplished. And immediately the Lord brings judgment on Nebuchadnezzar. And for seven years, he finds himself in a field long hair, nails grown out like a wild beast eating grass off of the ground. And so, so we can't take ownership of anything. We can o- take ownership of our responsibility, but God owns it all. Amen? And as a church, God owns it all. Man, we didn't get here because of anything that we've done that the Lord hasn't given us and empowered us to do it with. Amen? And so we own it all. The second principle that he gives is the principle of responsibility. The first is ownership. The second is responsibility. We are responsible with what we've been given. Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Our responsibility is to take what God has given us and to do everything we do for him. Work hard at it with our whole heart to bring him honor and glory. Uh, I I, I thought this was really good. Uh, Owners have rights. Stewards have responsibilities. We don't own anything, but we are responsible with everything we've been given. All right? Praise God. The third principle is the principle of accountability. Uh, We're all going to stand and give account for what we do with what we've been given. Amen. And thank God there is grace because some of us, many of us, maybe all of us at times in our life have blown it. We haven't done, haven't acted faithfully. That's why I really believe it's a fallacy to think that you can do anything in and of yourself apart from what God has said in his word and think that you're okay with the Lord. It's deception. You have to obey God's word as a faithful steward. And to know God, you got to know his word. And so to obey him, you got to obey his word. And so, so many people run around today saying, I got a relationship with God. I believe in God. Belief in God is not enough. The Bible says the demons believe. The devil believes, but it's, but it's yieldedness. It's surrender to him, amen. And so, and the stewards, what do we do? We yield and surrender our lives to the Lord, and we are responsible to him, and we will be held accountable with what we do. Every one of us will stand before the Lord, and we will not stand before the Lord corporately. We will stand before the Lord individually. I will give account for me and not for you, and you will give account for you and not for me. We all have to give an account to the Lord. And the most, first and most important thing that we understand about our stewardship is our relationship with Jesus. I think that's the first and foremost important thing, that we are stewards of that relationship and that we honor the Lord in the way we live our lives and in our relationship with him. And then all the other things that flow out of it, the money, the giftings, the time we have, it all flows out of that starts with that relationship, that, that coming to know him. Amen. And then the fourth principle is the principle of reward. God didn't just give us something uh, just so that we can, we can struggle, toll, or do this work, or work hard, and then at the end of the day, get nothing in return. God is the great rewarder. He does reward. The Bible says in one place, behold, I come quick, quickly with my reward in my hand. The Lord is the rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. Those who wholeheartedly go after it, you're going to find reward. This morning, we had the awesome privilege of just experiencing God's presence. Just a touch of what heaven's probably going to be like. Just a little bit, we got to experience that. That was a privilege. That was an honor that we get. That's the reward of those who seek him. Amen. Amen. Those who earnestly love and desire to be in a place with him get to experience his goodness, his mercy, his love, his grace. 
And then those that maybe aren't walking with the Lord can come into an environment like this and feel something, even though they might not be in the same place as the person who's wholeheartedly after God. They feel the grace, the mercy, the love of God. It, it spills over onto them, amen. And that's why I say, if you haven't committed your life to Christ, go hard after him because the reward of that is far greater than anything you can achieve in this world, amen. <laughs> Praise God. Go after him, amen. Amen. Colossians 3, 24, he says, uh, he, he finishes that out. He says, uh, uh, let me just read the whole verse again. Whatever you do, do work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is Christ the Lord you are serving. You're not serving me. You're not serving Brother Brandon. You're not serving anybody. Ultimately, you're serving the Lord. You know, I used to have a problem with preaching the passages when you talk about uh, the relationship between husbands and wives, children and parents, children and parents, uh, masters and slaves, I used to have a problem with pe preaching those passages. I always felt uncomfortable because it seemed like you know those were uh, waters that you could get in where people would become offended very easy. But when you read the text and you read what the apostle was writing to those individuals he was writing to, he says, "Remember, whatever all that you do, wives submitting to your husband, you do it as unto the Lord." Husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. It's under the Lord. Uh, ch children, obey your parents in the Lord. Amen. Uh, obey, masters, treat your s slaves good because you're a, a son of God, and that's your brother or sister in Christ. And slaves, when you are uh, serving your masters, remember, you're doing it under the Lord. Even when they're not around, do what you do is under the Lord because the Lord watches all the time. And so we look at all the issues of the life that we deal with and all the things that can seem to be controversial, but at the end of the day, we should never, nothing should be controversial for us because we do everything we do is under the Lord. Amen. Is that all right? Did that make sense? All right. Okay, where am I at here? Okay. So we know that he is going to reward us. We will all, we will all, we all should long to hear the master say this in the scriptures. Well done, good and faithful. My wife sent me this meme the other day of a, a dried up piece of well done steak. And she said, and it said, well done is for good and faithful, not for steak. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> And I might have me a steak today, and it won't be well done. It will be medium rare. Come on. I believe if Jesus serves a, a sirloin in the kingdom, amen, it will be medium rare. I just believe that. Amen. <laughs> uh, I thought about this today. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into this. I'm going to keep rolling here. But honestly, I thought about this today uh, or this week when I was looking at this. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. This is in Matthew. It's the, the parable of the talents. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Little much, little much. And so whatever we do, whatever we do, it doesn't matter how much that we've been given, how much, how much uh, that the Lord has entrusted us with. Uh, there's much more that he wants to bless us with. Amen. And, and, and the evaluation of little, you've been faithful over little, I'm going to make you ruler over much. I'm going to give you more responsibility, give you, make you, give you much more than what you currently have right now. No matter how much we attain or achieve in this life, if we take that and we do it faithfully, God has so much more for us in store. Praise God. He desires to bless us, bless us upon blessing, upon blessing, upon blessing, upon blessing. The Lord's desire is to bless his people. God is not stingy. <laughs> Sometimes we accuse God of being stingy, but the reason why he ain't giving us what we want at the time is because he knows we can't handle it at the time. And it would be more detrimental to us than helpful, praise God. And so when we're faithful with what he's entrusted us with in his good uh, time and in his good uh, examination or evaluation, he'll give us more as he desires for us to have more. Amen? Praise God. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, I was praying again this week too, and there's another aspect of stewardship that I was thinking about, and I just I was, felt like I was led to try to do some research on this, and that's the idea of discipleship versus stewardship. What is the difference between discipleship and stewardship? Somebody said this, that, uh, that they're, one, they're, they're, they're two sides of the same coin, that there's really no difference between uh, discipleship and stewardship, discipleship could be defined as that coming to God and uh, following Christ, denying, forsaking everything else. And stewardship is the being grateful for what God has given you and taking that 
and managing it the way that he desires for you to manage it. Uh, one gentleman wrote this. He said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of all of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. Let me read that again. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. It all belongs to Jesus. In him, through him, and by him was all things created in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. Nothing, 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 nothing that doesn't belong ultimately to God. Remember, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell therein. Effective stewardship and intentional discipleship are two sides of the same coin. I want to talk about the idea of uh, stewarding our treasure, amen? So we're going to talk about uh, giving of treasure. We talked about talents last week. And we talked about time the week before. And I, and I just really believe we lean in for just the next few moments and just see what the Lord wants to speak to us about this. We've seen God bless us over the course of our lives. There's not a single individual in the room that can say that if they really look and examine their lives, that they haven't been blessed by God. I think the problem is, is we tend to focus, uh, we tend to evaluate the blessing on what somebody else has versus what we have. We evaluate the blessing on based on what we want and what we need versus what we need. And we, and, and we just got a skewed look at what it means to be blessed by God. If you have air in your lungs, blood pumping through your veins. If you woke up this morning, you're blessed. I believe I could even go as far as to say that, that, um, that there's nothing that even we go through in life that's, that's hard or tragic, that is bad, that is horrible, that we can't find the blessing of God in. I think someone quoted the verse this morning out of Psalms that it was in affliction that I learned to love your word. The Lord desires to use everything for our good. And in everything, we can find the blessing of God in it. Praise God. God doesn't waste anything. God doesn't waste anything, and he uses everything for his purpose, for our good, and for his glory. Come on. Praise God. Praise God. So let me just talk a little bit about giving and just forget about that picture you saw a minute ago. That's not what I'm coming after, all right? <laughs> Gold chains and Cadillacs. Woo! <laughs> maybe, maybe Texas World have gift cards, but I'll just leave that alone. No, that's just a bad joke. <laughs> Sorry, babe. All right. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7. I want to start with this verse right here. And I'm going to give you four principles of giving, all right? 2 Corinthians, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7 says, But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in, our love, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Now, just to kind of give you some context, Paul's writing to this church, this church that was full of spiritual gifts. If you study the first and second Corinthians, you'll see that this was a church that had the gifts in operation in the church. And in this particular uh, chapter here, he's addressing a need that had been brought up about the church in Jerusalem. It was a sister church. The founding church in Jerusalem was going through some great uh, adversity and hardship. And so the word had went out throughout the world that they were in need. Uh, there was, there was, they had been uh, stricken by persecution. Uh, there was there was need of, of 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 resource in that community, and so the word went out, and the churches around the evangelized world began to respond with a commitment to give a monetary offering to help support the church in Jerusalem. And so Paul's writing this letter to remind this church that you made a commitment a year ago that you would support this church. And I just we're going we're getting ready to come and 
collect that offering from you. We just want you not to be unprepared when we come to get it. And so he's telling them in this verse here in verse 7, he says, you excel in all these areas, but I want you to excel in this act of grace too. And this act of grace means, it, literally the Greek word here is keros, and it refers to the expression of generosity. He's saying, I want you to act in this uh, act of generosity as you excel in all these other areas in your, in your ability to speak and ability to to prophesy, your ability to preach the word, your ability to do all these other things. I want you to as much so uh, excel in the gift of giving. Amen. Because the gift of giving is a real thing. Amen. We'll see that in the scriptures, but the gift of giving is a real thing. He says, I want you to excel in this grace also. And then he goes on later in that chapter to talk about, and he compares to the generosity of Jesus making himself poor so that we could be rich. Let us use that as our example and let us give unto others like Jesus gave to us. Amen? There's a passage in the book of Proverbs that says that when we lend to the, when we uh, give to the poor, we lend to God. Amen? God has designed and, and the way, God has designed giving as a way for us to partner with him. And it's never been about money. When we talk about the giving of our treasure, it's not about money for the believer. Well, how can you say that, Pastor? Because I write a check, or I give, I slide my card, or I give, I text to give, I, I, I give in the offering place. What do you mean it's not about money? It's never been about money. It's always been about our heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Paul would write in another place, he would say, you got to be careful if you're going to be a leader in the church, that, you don't, that you're not greedy because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And he says, so you can't let that be the, the reason for why you do it. You can't be, it can't be about money. And so many times when we talk about this, I say many times I'm saying this is a broad generalization. We haven't experienced that here. But people tend to think it's about a money grab. And for God, it's not about a money grab. It's about a heart grab. He wants to lay hold of our heart, and he wants us to lay hold of his heart. And so it's not about money. So Paul says, I want you to have the same mind as Christ, amen, and act out this grace. Excel in this grace. Excel. Go after it with greater measure. There's four principles of giving here. I want to lay these out to you. The first uh, principle is giving, is giving is to be a priority. Giving is to be a priority. We are know if we read out throughout the scriptures from Genesis Revelation, giving is talked about all throughout the scripture. God so loved the world that he gave. We read that passage in the New Testament, but do you know that passage, passage transcends the New Testament by eternity? What do you mean by that, Pastor? The Bible says before the foundations of the earth, the Lamb of God was slain. It was always in the heart of God to give the Son as a, as a ransom to buy us back because he knew that we would be in a state of, of great uh, poverty spiritually and that we would have to be ransomed back. And so what did Jesus, he gave everything. So priority in the uh, giving is a priority throughout the whole of Scripture. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. It's got to be a priority to us. As the Lord has given us life, we ought to give back to him everything in our life, our time, our talent, and our treasure, and it has to be a priority to us. We'll talk in just a minute about the uh, uh, giving in, uh, in proportion to what you have. We'll talk a little bit about that. But what the Lord desires, before we talk about amounts, you know, it's, it's a funny when you talk about um, like uh, tithing. Tithing is a, is a percentage of, of giving. And we, we'll, we know in the Old Testament, tithing meant a tenth. And I'm getting way ahead of myself. But the Lord would set up a ways in which people could practice uh, giving and, and to prioritize their life in their giving. And they would give of the first fruits of what they had. They would bring the first of what they had to God. Because if we don't bring God the first, then God's not at the top of our priority list. Amen. If we put God down at the bottom, if we say, I'll get to it if I've got time to get to it, or if I'll, I'll give to it if I've got it left over to give, then God doesn't become the priority. Everything else becomes the priority. And so if we don't have this mindset that my giving is a priority, and that's of my time, my talent, and my treasure, if it's not the first thing that I'm thinking about how I can give to God, then what I'm, I'm going to miss it along the way. Amen. Is that all right? Is that, is that, 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 does that make sense? All right? So giving has to become 
a priority. It was a priority to God because there was no other way which men could be saved. But that Christ would come and give his life. So to God, it was a priority. He gave first before we could ever give. Again, before the foundations of the earth, it was in the heart of God to give. Praise God. He gave life by bringing life into the, man, the nostrils of man. The second principle of giving is this. Giving is to be done proportionately. So like I said, I got ahead of myself. Look at this, uh, Malachi 3.10. This was referenced this morning. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Malachi 3.10. He's talking to the people of God in this context because they were bringing him half-hearted offerings. They were bringing him uh, sacrificial offerings of, of, of lambs that were crippled and lame and diseased. And he says, you're not giving me the best of your best and you've forsaken my house. And another place, he would, the prophet Haggai would say, he says, you're going out and you're spending all your time and your energy building things for yourself and you're not concerned with me, the Lord. You're not concerned with me, the Lord. And, and, now, and you find yourself in want. You find yourself... Uh, stricken with, with blo- you, you, there's, you know, you put money in your pockets, but there's holes in your pockets. There's, there's never enough at the end of the day. He says, come and build me a house and watch and see what I do. You know, there's a lot of people who have, uh, feel a certain way about tithing. You know, New Testament, in the New Testament, for instance. Um, and the, and tithe, the tithe was an Old Testament law that was put into practice by Moses but it preceded the law by 400 years. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but but we don't see the act of tithing in the New Testament. We don't see the actual tithing of the temple tax or, you know, the law because we're not under the law in the New Testament. Some people will debate, you know, do I, am I supposed to tithe as a New Testament believer? Do I tithe a tenth? A tenth meaning 10% of what your, what your gross is. Now, many people in this church today, they practice the tithe. My wife and I practice the tithe. We've done it most of our lives. That's how we were taught as a child. I was taught as a child growing up that you give to God his first, amen, and then the Lord will bless the rest if you give to God his first. And so the tithe was something that was enacted in the Old Testament. The law made it uh, a requirement for the people of God to do it as they would bring their harvest in or, or their, their crops or their, their flocks, whatever, and they were to give back to and that would provide for the ministry of the house. It would provide for the priest that would work in the house. They would have a portion of that because the priest, the Levitical priest, didn't have a portion in the land. They didn't have an inheritance in the land. Their, their portion was God. And so God's way of rewarding them was they would, be, they would be blessed by this. And so those that served in the temple were blessed by the tithe. Well, we don't see the word tithe in the New Testament except referring to the Old Testament. We see it in the book, in the Gospels a, a few times, and we see it in the book of Hebrews talking about Melchizedek. But here's what we do know about the tithe. The tithe was a principle that was enacted through Abraham by, I believe, the leading of the Lord. Abraham, after coming back from a battle, fighting with the enemies, saving and rescuing his his nephew Lot, he meets a priest named Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek wasn't a Hebrew. He wasn't a Jew. He was the priest of Salem. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about him, but when you get into the book of Hebrews, it talks about Melchizedek being a type of Christ. Christ is, the, is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who had no beginning and no end, no father, not, no mother. He, had no, he wasn't born. He was, always was, and he always is, and he always will be. And that's who Christ is. He's the high priest. And so when Abraham would come back, he would give uh, uh, Melchizedek a tenth of all of his spoils, everything that he had, he had taken from battle, and he would give God praise. He'd say, the Lord is my shield, my exceeding great reward. See, when we practice and we prioritize giving in our life, whatever area it is, and, and I think this is the thing we really need to examine our hearts, what area are we holding back from God? Is it our time? Maybe some of us are giving weekly in the offering, but man, we're not gonna give God any extra time during the week. Maybe some of us are giving in the offering and we're showing up for service, but we're not going to use our gifts to bring God glory and honor. We're withholding from what the Lord deserves. And so, so in, the, in the concept of giving financially in tithe, so the tithe was a principle that was enacted before the law, and it's a principle that we can still follow today. But we do know that the principle of giving is still something that we should practice as believers throughout the whole of the Bible and throughout the whole experience of our life. We ought to give... 
Much has been given, much is required. The Lord has blessed us with more than we could ever imagine or think. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And so the priority of giving is a must, and, the, and, and we're, we're to do it proportionally. The Lord doesn't expect us to give more than what we have. He, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 11 says, Now you should finish what you started. Let the ignorance you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. The Lord, like I said, isn't, isn't doing a money grab. He's not greedy, but he's saying, if you'll give to me the portion that, that, that I've asked of you to give, then out of what you have, I'll bless it back more than you could ever imagine or think. But it's an act of faith. Malachi said, bring the tithe into the store. Somebody told me this a couple weeks ago. We were having a roundtable discussion and they said, Pastor, you just seem like you're, you feel so uneasy talking about money. Just say it. Just say it. It's the Bible says it, so you just say it. And it's not that I feel uneasy talking about money, but I know uh, in my own heart, in my own mind, that when you, when you, when you, when you walk up to the, the, uh, to, the, to the edge of this thing, that, that people can mis- conceive, misperceive what you're trying to say. And I tell you what I'm trying to say is here, I want to honor God's word in everything that I say and do. Amen. And I want to honor God's word in practice. I want to honor God's word in in what I say. I want to honor God's word in every aspect of my life. Uh, I I don't want to miss anything here because there's there's another portion of scripture I want to get to in just a minute. I don't want to miss that. I want to keep you here all day. But he says to them in Malachi, he says first, he says, test me. He says, you bring it back to the house and test me. God desires us to put our faith to the test. Test the Lord. Giving is all about the heart, and it is an act of faith. It's an action of faith because we're giving to something that we don't necessarily see in the now a return on. We're trusting that God's going to give back to us at the appropriate time, but we're giving when we don't have a promise that that's coming back other than his word. And that's good enough promise, right? But if you're new to the faith or you're struggling in your faith, that can be a hard one to do. To step out into faith, amen. The Lord desires to walk through that with you. And he says, if you'll you'll just trust me and you try me, then watch and see what I can do. Somebody said it this way, pastor, I can't afford to give. And I would say to you, brother, sister, you can't afford not to give. You can't afford not to give. Give, and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give back into your bosom. The Lord is a rewarder. What does the Bible say? That the Lord, the Lord is a reward of those who diligently seek him? That's in every area of our life. If we're, if we're, if we're stewarding our time in prayer and study, we're going to get rewarded. If we're stewarding our time with our gifts and abilities, we're going to get rewarded. What's he going to do? He's going to give us more gifts to serve him. He's going to cause us to be a greater blessing in the lives of others. He's going to give us greater responsibility. He's going to elevate us. Amen. And if we serve the Lord and trust him with our treasure, he's going to meet every one of our needs. But I tell you what, he'll not only do that, he promised this to Peter. Peter said to Peter, Peter and uh, uh, Jesus was having this conversation with a young rich ruler. And, this, and he comes to Jesus and he, he wants to know what he has to do to get eternal life. And, and he's, he's rich, he's got money, he's got uh, affluence, he's, got, uh, he's, he's popular in the community, he's somebody of influence. But yet he's lacking that piece of security in his life of, of a relationship with God. And the Bible says that he, Jesus sees the man coming and he says, and you got to read Mark's gospel because I love the way Mark says it. Mark says Jesus sees him and he loves him. God even loves the disobedient. God loves the wayward. God loves the lost. God loves his sons and his daughters. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the love of God doesn't give us assurance that we're going to receive all that God has for us. Because we've got to choose it. God loves me, but I've got to choose to love him back. And his love doesn't trump my free will. And so the young rich ruler comes to Jesus 
and he's struggling, and he wants to know what he has to do to inherit. He's heard Jesus' words, obviously, and he knows he's got something that's real, and so he wants to know how, I, how can he have that assurance, that confidence. And Jesus looks at him, and he loves him, and he says, you know the law. Honor your father and mother. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't covet. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. And the, and the man says, I've done all of those things since my youth. He says, yeah, but you lack one thing. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. See, discipleship and stewardship are two sides of the same coin. He says, you've got to give up everything. I'm grabbing for your heart, but the world, the money has a hold of your heart. A man can't serve two masters. He loves the one and, and, and hates the other. He clings to the one and he despises the other. And the man says, I, he's sad. He says, he says I, I don't know. He doesn't really say anything, but the Bible says he just, he drops his head and he, he walks away. But see, because he was doing everything he could do in the natural to be good and to be well-pleasing to God. But the thing that he wasn't doing was surrendering his life to God. Faith in the Lord. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And Jesus, who's God in the flesh, says, you got to sell everything and come follow me. Come and have a relationship with me. Let everything else just fade in comparison to me. Come and follow me, and I'll give you life eternal. And he's like, I can't do that. I don't have a, the faith to do that. And, and here's the thing. So many of us in the church today lack faith in the Lord to provide for us. And we'll say stuff like, I would love to give in this area of my life. I just don't have the time. Or I just don't have the money, the resource. And, and that's, that's, that's not good. That hinders us. That keeps us from doing what the Lord's called us to do. I want to give you the last principle, and then I want to move, or last two principles. I'm going to do these fast, and I want to move to this passage of Scripture, and I'm going to be done, I promise, all right? All right. I'm breathing hard not because I'm nervous. I'm breathing hard because I'm fat. But anyway, I'm going to get over that. I'm going to steward my body better this year, I promise. I'm serious. I'm going to steward my body better this year. And you hold me accountable, all right? You all hold me accountable, all right? All right. Two more principles. The first principle was make giving a priority. Second was give proportionately. Give something. Everybody should start somewhere. Do something. Because the New Testament, you'll see it in the New Testament. There isn't a command to give a percentage, but it says give of what you have. Give, of, get out of, give out of your abundance. Give something. If you're not practicing giving at all, start doing something. Say, when you get your paycheck on Sunday, and not, don't, I don't see if you give it or not. I don't check those things. You can ask the people here. I don't go around checking the books and see who's given and who's not given. That's between you and the Lord, ultimately. That really is between you and the Lord. But let me tell you something the Lord does see. And when you get that paycheck, proportion out a portion for him and give it to him first. Amen. The reason why we give it to the church, we bring it to the storehouse, the place where you're fed on a weekly basis, the place where you're ministered to, is because that's the way that God set it up so that that ministry can keep, can, can keep going on and so that ministry can be a light in the community in which it's planted and which it, where, where it's at, all right? But then you can give above and beyond that to other places. So, so you give proportionally, you give, uh, make it a priority, you give sacrificially. The woman who had just a little, who went into the temple, the Bible says in Luke chapter 21, verse 1 through 4, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. Doesn't matter if I'm watching if you're giving or not. If Sister Chastity's watching, if you're giving or not. If Pastor Donzel's watching, if you're giving or not. The Lord's watching. And he knows what, where you're giving it from. What, where's it coming from? Is it coming from a heart of love for him and a, a heart of sacrifice unto the Lord? Because giving isn't, never was meant, in any area of our life, giving wasn't meant to be comfortable. But it was meant to be done with joy. 
It's, it's never going to be comfortable to sacrificially give. But there's joy in giving. I'm telling you, you will receive joy that you didn't even know you could have when you begin to obey God's word and just do what he says and sacrifice your, your, your pride, sacrifice your fear, sacrifice your doubt, sacrifice your greed, your lust, whatever it may be, and do what the Lord says, and you'll find a reward that you never thought imaginable that you could have. When it's a struggle for you to give anything unto the Lord, then it's a hard issue. But I, and I've been there, and I've been there, and I'm not completely there right now. I'm not completely where I need to be right now. There's areas in my life where it's a struggle to completely surrender all these things over to the Lord. But I'm working towards that, Brother Mike, because I'm finding out the more that I do it, the more that I realize when I can give those things up, they don't have a hold on me anymore. They can't hold me captive. Most people who give that don't give, we'll just talk about money for a second. A lot of times, it's usually one of two things, and I don't know this like statistically, but I'm just, in my thought process, it's either greed or fear. Or both. You don't give because you want more, 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 more. Or you don't give because you think, if I give, what am I going to do? I want to, and I want to close with this. And I'll come back with my last principle, but I want to close with this. I want to come to this. this I have to read this. I wasn't, was debating if I was going to get to it or not, but 1 Kings chapter 17. Let's put that up there. 1 Kings chapter 17. If you're new to the church, you don't hear these kind of messages all the time. Uh, we, just, we just go as the Lord leads us in this church. We let him lead us. But this is very important. First, uh, First Kings chapter 17. Uh, I need some glasses. <laughs> I thought I brought some up. Did I bring some up? Otherwise, I have to have my wife's glasses. All right, don't nobody laugh. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> Security. Security. <laughs> Bring the mace. <laughs> Let. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen to what I'm saying, not what I'm saying. Look, what we, we, we were able to accomplish in about two years, we paid off about $60,000 of debt in two years. Amen. Praise God. Amen. That's good. But I'm not real happy with that in the sense that we've had this debt for 10 years, and it took me the last two years to get serious about it. And in that, I didn't promote that very well. We probably would have had that paid off in a couple of months. I guarantee we could have had. I'm glad we're doing it. I rejoice in that. But what, why am I saying that? Because I have struggled in this area to preach on these types of messages in the past. I said a minute ago, I'm going to preach the word of God. I am. I'm not going to be ashamed to preach the word of God. But in the past, I don't want to make it about that and make people think a certain way that this is what we're about. But we're not about that. Amen. And so we're not going to we're not going to we're not going to do that. We're not going to tiptoe around these things anymore. Praise God. Is that all right? <laughs> Praise God. You're closing, right? You got to land this baby. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. I want to read this. I thought this was I was talking I was thinking about I was praying about this and this is what came to mind. Actually it came in a conversation. That me and Pat, brother Mike over there was having on Sunday or Monday, and we were talking about the mortgage cancellation. We were just talking about giving and talking about today's message and and talking about tithing and tithing biblically, Old Testament versus New Testament. We were talking about that, and uh, one of the things that kind of was brought up in conversation that some people you know can't give what they don't have, right? You can't give more than what you have, or you can't give what you don't have. And there are those times where well, the Scripture does teach us to practice giving proportionately. So the Lord doesn't want to bankrupt us, 
for the moments in his life that he does want to bankrupt our flesh. And he wants to bring us up to a point that it's radical abandonment to self and total and radical trust of him. Me and my wife did youth ministry for years. We've been, you know, been married 28 years this November. Amen, I got that right, didn't I? Praise God. I don't have to get a ride home today, so. And we've served the Lord with our whole heart. We've served in, in the Lord in the churches that we've been in. In fact, we've used our gifts and we've used our time to serve the Lord. We've given of our finances and practiced those things of giving. Not perfectly. The older we've gotten and the more we've seen God's faithfulness, I don't know why. It's just We just matured in the Lord. We've been more faithful to do those things as we've gotten older. Back in 2013, 2012, 2013, 2013, we were getting ready to launch a ministry called Project 9. And we were asked to go ahead and make it a full-blown church launch. We were going to eventually, it was originally going to be a church campus. And it was going to be a part of the ministry we were part of. And the pastor felt like it should be just an independent work. And so asked us to launch. Now watch this. So I had, I was a full-time at the church that I served at. I lived in a parsonage. I didn't pay rent. Didn't have a mortgage. Uh, my wife worked a job that uh, they had just changed the policy on the job. She's a bus driver that you had to have so many hours uh, a week driving a bus to get insurance. Otherwise, if you didn't have that, if you didn't meet that hourly amount, then you had to pick up your insurance. It was it was it was a financial a loss to us. I was and I was and we launched the church in the summertime, and she doesn't even work in the summertime because she's a bus driver. I mean, I lost my full time position. I had to go back to work and get a job. Nothing wrong with that, but that's where we were at. I had to take on a mortgage payment that I hadn't had in thirteen years, being on staff at a church. She was getting ready to lose our insurance because she didn't have a 60-hour run on her job. And here we find ourselves in this moment. And I remember thinking, honey, you know what? We've never actually ever really, in our ministry, we've taken steps of faith. but We've never had a step out of the boat moment in our ministry where it didn't look to make sense on paper. And we didn't have a big savings that we could draw from. That was my fault. I should have done better with my finances. Stewarded that part better, but didn't have that. And the Lord never forsook us one moment in that. We never went without one day. We never missed a mortgage payment. Praise God. Her insurance, she went back to work. And she was, and the way that it works in the union, she wasn't high enough in the union to get the 60-hour run, and things just happened to move around. She had the favor of God, and she got the 60-hour run. Shouldn't have got it, amen? What's my point of saying that? There are moments when God wants us to wants to bankrupt the flesh, bankrupt the doubt, bankrupt the fear in our lives, and we can't say, I can't afford to do something. No, every, everything is on the line right now. We've got to be willing to take this step of faith and trust the Lord. Amen. I need some music. Praise God. God's got you. He's not a man that he should lie. I think some of the lack or want in our life is because we're not willing to trust the Lord. And, 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 and I learned a powerful lesson in my faith walk that there are moments when the Lord says to trust him that I'm not going to see the result immediately. That's why I got to trust him. They that wait upon the Lord. So I was reading this text. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this real quick, all right? Praise God. Uh, 
I heard you laugh, Dad. I am your son, by the way. All right. Okay. So Elijah is the prophet, and he prophesies to the northern. I want to do this quickly. Elijah prophesies to the northern kingdom, to split kingdom, and Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom, and he is wicked. I mean, he's, he's depraved. He married a depraved woman. Who you marry, who you associate yourself. Let me tell you something. The Bible says don't be unevenly yoked, young people. Make sure you find somebody that loves the Lord more than you. Amen? Amen. Praise God. If you're, if you're searching and you're a believer, make sure you find somebody. Look for somebody that loves Jesus. Amen? But anyway, so he marries this depraved, uh, wicked, wicked, devilish woman full of demons, I believe. And he's influenced even worse by her. And so God is bringing judgment on the, on the people. And through the word of the prophet Elijah, drought comes on the land. There's no rain. The heavens are shut up for three and a half years. And so the Bible tells Elijah in the midst of this drought to go down to a brook. And he says, I'm going to take care of you by the brook. And Elijah being the man of God, he steps out in faith. He goes and he hides by a brook. And the Bible says while he's at the brook... Not only is there water there, but the Lord is supernaturally provi- uh, providing for him by the, mouth of, by the mouth or feet of a raven, meat, bread, whatever he needs to eat for that season. God will use some unexpected ways to meet your needs. So that's, I just thought, thank you, Holy Ghost. The Bible says he stores up the wicked. He stores up the, the wealth of the wicked for the righteous. Do you know that God would use a raven to bring Elijah a provision, and a raven is considered an unclean animal? Amen. Hallelujah. God will get, this, God will get it to you. Uh, don't, you. don't you doubt it. God will get it to you. Just trust the Lord. Amen. And he's there by the brook, and things are going good. But guess what? The brook, the brook dries up. This is the whole thing about the walk of faith. When God calls you to step into a thing, it may be just for a season. And that season will come to an end. You trusted God in that season, but you've got to trust him in the next season. Amen. And just remember what he did in the previous season and let it help you carry you through to the next season. Amen. Praise God. And so the brook dries up and he tells him, he says, listen, I want you to, this is what I want you to do. I don't know what, what kind of conversation Elijah was having with the Lord. Maybe he was doubting. I don't know, but the Lord says, don't worry. I got a plan. There's a widow in the, in the village of Zarephath in the country of Sidon, down there in a Gentile land, I'm going to send you down there. And I've already commanded her to provide for you. So Elijah makes his 80-plus mile journey from the brook to the village. And this is where we're going to pick it up. Somebody hear what I'm trying to say to you today, all right? Don't let your lack determine your faith. Don't let your want determine God's will for your life. I don't know if that one made sense, but. The word of Zarephath belongs to Sidon. Dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks and, she, and he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And so he sees the woman. Everything's lining up just the way that God says. Now, just remember this. Zarephath, Sidon, the, the country of Sidon, they're not, they don't believe in the God of Israel. They are, they're polytheistic. They believe in multiple gods. They don't honor the Lord. And most likely this woman was a Gentile. She wasn't a believer. She wasn't an Israeli, Israeli woman. She was a Gentile woman. How do we know that? Because Jesus would say in the Gospels, he said, God sent the prophet Elijah down to uh, a Gentile land while all these other widows, these Israeli, Israeli uh, these Hebrew widows were up here starving to death. And they got mad and wanted to stone him for it. Because he was saying a prophet isn't accepted in his own home. All right. I promise I'm almost there. So he arose, he went, he said, bring me a little water from the vessel drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Bring me a morsel. And I looked this up. Different translations say a little bite or a little bit. 
He was asking, just bring me a mouthful. Bring me a, a biscuit, enough that I can get in my mouth. He wasn't saying, make me a cake. He's saying, give me just a portion before you feed yourself. Oh, man, they said, oh, my goodness. I, I'm feeling things inside of me. I didn't even know what was inside of there. Amen. <laughs> Praise God, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God isn't asking us. I meant that as excited. I'm excited. You know the way you looked at me. I mean, I'm excited. I, you listen, if it's your first time here, just forgive us, you know. The Lord's working on me. I'm a work in progress. Come next week, you'll hear a dynamic preacher preach. But listen, hey, praise God. He said, bring me a little bit. Not the whole thing, just a little bit. Listen to her response. As the Lord your God, as the Lord your God. You, words mean something. Phrases mean something in the Bible. She wasn't a believer. She was desperate. But she wouldn't believe. She said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. She says, all I have is a little. The little bite that you want, I can't even give that much. It's going to require too much of me. You're asking too much of me. The Lord will always affirm his command with an encouragement of the promise. Amen? If the Lord commands you something, he will encourage you with a promise. I mean, come on, some get a hold of that. If the Lord gives you a command, he will confirm it and encourage you with, he'll back it up with a promise. Amen? A command is telling you what to do. A promise is telling you what he will do. Amen? Faith is about taking a step. Faith is about action. Amen. It's about partnering with God. But before the Lord, the Lord, because it's about a heart grab. Amen. He wants to grab our hearts. So he needs to know that our heart's willing to step out. Then he'll show himself faithful. It doesn't mean that he's not faithful already. But he just needs to prove to us that we're willing to trust him. Amen. So, oh, man. Praise God. All right. I'm almost there. Got the landing gear down. All I have is a little. I don't have enough. And now I'm gather, gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. There's no hope. Fear will bring hopelessness. Faith will produce hope. What you go through produces in your life, amen, count it not strange when you meet various trials. I love what the scripture says. Brother Chris, he doesn't say count it strange if you meet various trials. When life is hard, it's all about adversity. It's about opposition. You're probably going to have as much hardship in your life, some of you more than you had good days. But it doesn't nullify the goodness of God. I'm there. Listen, okay. All right. And now I'm gathering a couple sticks to make them. Now watch this. I'm going to make this little bit I have. I can't give it to you. And I've got and give it to you. She knew he was the man of God. She said, the Lord's your God. She must have knew who he was, I'm assuming. She says, I can't give it to you because I ain't got it to give. And listen what the Lord says. He backs up his, com his commandment. You got to get this, man. Woo. He said to Elijah, he said, I commanded her to take care of you. Now I'm going into the scenario thinking God already had a conversation with her. This ain't just about the widow's faith. It's about the man of God's faith too. Because when he gets there, he don't hear what the Lord had said. He meets opposition. I ain't got it to give. But Lord, you said that you was going to lead my steps. That the steps of the righteous have never been forsaken or 
or your seed begging for bread. You said you'd command the widow to take care of me. And she's telling me something different. <laughs> man, I, I, I don't, man, I don't even know what to even do right now. I'm so excited. You've got to trust the Lord in all things. Amen. Because he's working all things out. For your good and for my good. Amen. Woo. Oh, man, man, man. Watch this. Elijah said to her, do not fear. She was motivated by fear. She seems like a pretty hospitable gal. She probably would have made him three cakes. But she didn't have it. She was afraid. Conversation was, how do I give when I can't even pay my light bill? Put food on my table. Put shoes on my kids' feet. And I'm telling you right now, it's the Lord that's going to provide for you in every aspect of your life and your kids' lives. Amen. Sometimes we stop the provision of the Lord because we stop short of just trusting Him and obeying His Word. Amen. And we let fear motivate us. Amen. And we let doubt drive us. But the Lord says, if you'll just step out in faith. Amen. I'm going to come right alongside of you. And I'm going to see this thing through. And I'm going to be good on my Word. Amen. 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 All right, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Elijah said, don't be afraid. Go and do as I have said. Now, when Elijah says, do as I have said, he's saying, do as God has said. Because he's just a spokesman. Don't shoot the messenger. Amen. He's just a messenger. He said, do as I said. He said, he's speaking for the Lord. Because the Lord already said it. Thus says the Lord your God. <laughs> okay, do as I said. But first, priority. First fruit. What comes first? Honor the Lord. If you don't have anything, honor the Lord with, your, with what you don't have. Thank Him in advance. But give Him honor first. Listen, I might not have it to give right now, but I thank you, God, when the blessing comes, I'm going to give it first, first thing. Amen. All right. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. <laughs> he says, Elijah said, don't be afraid. First make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. It's going to take some faith. Sister, it's going to take some faith. Brother, but honor the Lord first. And then watch and see how he provides. For thus says the Lord. The Lord God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Now, here's a principle that I believe in. I believe there are seasons of plenty, enough to go around for everybody. The Corinthian church was experiencing a season of plenty and the Jerusalem church was experiencing a season of want, of not enough. There's going to be seasons in my life and your life where there isn't going to seem to be enough, but God says, I'll take care of you through it all. Amen. Because why? He's more than enough. Oh, my goodness. He says, I'm going to provide for you until the rains come back. See, the thing you're walking through isn't meant to stay. It's meant to come to do what it's supposed to do and fulfill its purpose. And then it shall pass. Amen. 
It doesn't come to stay. It comes to pass. But again, he works all things together for the good of those who love him. So he'll take the seasons of not enough to develop in you a, a heart and a spirit of tenacity, a spirit of resolve that you'll trust God regardless of what you go through. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to tell us the season you don't have to look out for and be worried about is the season of not enough. That's the good season to be in because that's when you really come to know the goodness of God. You got to be careful in the season of plenty lest you forget the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. You got something? <laughs> the last principle. The last principle. The Bible says that she gave it and the Lord answered. I don't have time to go into the portion where she lost her son because even in that season where you just trust God, it doesn't mean that, that greater adversity might not come to step in the way. She did what the man of God had said. She fed the man of God. The barrel never ran empty. The jug never ran empty. Amen. It was just enough to meet her needs along the way. And then in the process of all of that, her son gets sick and he dies. And her words to the man of God is, why would you bring this on me? And the Bible says that the man of God goes to the Lord. And he, what does he say? Why would you bring this on her? <laughs> Lord, why would you allow this to happen to this woman who obeyed your word and did what you told her to do? And now her most precious thing. The oil wasn't the most precious thing to her. The, the flour wasn't the most precious thing to her. It was her son. Amen. And now he's dead. And when the Lord meets her need and he resurrects that son, she says, now I know that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. <laughs> See, the Lord will take us to the place. The Lord will take us to the place where he wants, us, wants to prove himself to us. Yeah. Try me and test me and see if I won't. <laughs> but if he knows that there's still a little bit in there the that has to be crucified, that has to be bankrupt, He's going to push a little harder. He's going to turn the fire up a little bit more. Why? Because he wants to burn away all the impurity. So that when you stand tried and tested, you stand pure. Amen. Before him who is pure. Woo. Hallelujah. 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 I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Fourth principle, giving is to be done cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I just want to encourage you today. This ain't a money grab. It's a heart grab. Let the Lord grab your heart today. Give him something. What do you have in your hand? Lord, I can't do this. I can't speak. I'm old. I, I'm out of, I'm out of, I'm, un, I'm irrelevant. I'm outdated. I'm out of style. I just don't have the strength anymore, the vigor. What's in your hand? Moses, what's in your hand? It don't take a whole lot for God to do a whole lot. He's the God of increase. He's the God of the impossible. He's the God of more than enough. It don't take a whole lot. It didn't take advanced military weaponry to take down the giants. Just a few little stones out of the brook. That's all it took. <laughs> it don't take a whole lot. Just a couple fish and a few loaves. And the masses are fed. <laughs> Woo! Come on, somebody. It don't take a whole lot. But do something. 
I challenge every one of us this week to go before the Lord and say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. What would you do with me? Here I am, Lord. What would you have me do? What would you have me do? Let's just sing something, amen.